Hey, good morning. Good to see everybody today. Do you have a Bible this morning? Tenth Division of Matthew's Gospel is where we will head in just a bit. It will take us a while to get there, but eventually we will, and we will read from that place, Matthew chapter 10. And while you're opening your Bible and getting settled, we welcome all of you. Thanks so much for being with our church family at Temple Terrace today. If you are visiting today, we welcome you especially. So happy that you've come our way. Hope you have occasion to come and worship with us again, and hope we can do that often and do that soon. You should have received a family report when you came in this morning. If you turn that on the back side, there's an outline for the lesson this morning. And this morning, I think in particular, that will help you. We're going to cover a lot of material in a very short amount of time, and so that will help you as we navigate our way through that. So good to see everybody this morning. You're visiting with us via live stream. Happy to have you with us today. If you're in Tampa Bay, we'd love to have you in our assembly. We hope you can come and do that very soon as well. It's great to be home with you today. Vicki and I have been out of town for the last uh, many days and uh, enjoyed that immensely. It's the first time we have done that in several years, and so we have enjoyed that, but we're very glad, very glad to be home and where we belong today and to be able to study with you this morning. This morning, today, is August the 6th. It is a reminder that at least on the calendar, if not on the thermometer, that, um, that summer is rapidly, rapidly coming to a close. Later this week, most of our elementary and middle and high school students are going to return to school, and in about two weeks, college students will follow thereafter. Our stores, if you go in and shop virtually anywhere, they are just full of back-to-school kinds of items. Some of you in this audience are going to be going to school for the very, very first time. <clears throat> Some of you are going to be making a transition, making a transition from elementary school to middle school or middle school to high school or high school to college. It's always a busy time for families because so much has to be done to get kids ready for school. You've got to, you to buy new shoes and maybe clothes and uniforms and backpacks and tons of other kinds of things. And just all around you, you know, you just see that back-to-school supply sign everywhere. And for every family, when summer ends and school begins, there's a new schedule that has to be put in place. Every school year presents its own unique challenges, doesn't it? Some of you are going to be driving to school this year for the very first time. That would be great fun for you. Some of you are going to be away from home, going to college or university for the very, very first time. And that, too, is a very exciting period. Moms and dads in this audience, regardless of what age your students are, you're going to have concern about your kids. You're going to ask questions. You're going to want to know, are they going to be safe? Are they going to get good grades? Are they going to make good friends? But I will also tell you that parents' greater concerns are going to be about greater matters, that there are more important issues that parents are going to be concerned about with every young person that goes to school, whether elementary school through college. These concerns will be the same, because many of your kids' classmates are going to come from broken homes. And that's certainly no fault of the child, and we understand that, but it means that these young people have witnessed failure in domestic relationships. Some of them live with one parent during the summer, another parent during the, during the school year. And so in all of that shuffle, so many of these young people feel lost and confused, and sometimes they feel worthless. And the challenge is that for so many of these young people, they, they've seen how a relationship can be destroyed, but not how a relationship can be built. And so even building a friendship can be a challenge to them. And for many of our kids, they're, they're going to go to a school with, with others who, who delight in breaking the rules. If you're in high school or college, even if you're going to a Christian high school or a Christian college, smoking, drinking, sex, drugs are going to be the focus of some of your classmates. Not a lot of respect for authority, rules, or anybody else. There are going to be some that don't try and some that do not care. The fact is they will make your day longer than it has to be, and they influence others to kind of join, to join their team. And for some of our young people who go to school, they're going to be dealing with people of broken morals. If they attend public schools, it is almost inevitable that they're going to face the openness of, of gay and lesbian students. And there's going to be a demand for acceptance and a rebuke if acceptance does not come. That's a different world than I went to school in. I would just tell you that. But of course, I'm older. But I would imagine, honestly, that even for those in the, in the age group just just under mine, that probably it's a, different, it's a different school environment than you were involved in as well. I will tell you this morning that I am extraordinarily grateful for every teacher and administrator in this audience today. 
for every person who fills a role in a classroom as a teacher and everybody in administration. Because you make a difference for good. You help shape the environment of your school and you help shape the lives that are under your influence on a daily basis. And for you, for you we thank God. If you look online or in person in in brick and mortar stores, it's it's extremely easy to find endless back to school supply lists. Countless items that the schools are or that students are expected to have and of course they're tailored to the grade level but there are three things that aren't on any of those lists that i want to share with you this morning i want you to consider three things with me this morning that are not on any back to school list that you will find in fact you can't find them in a store you can't buy them in a store but i believe they can make a huge difference in your life and in your school experience. Now, I'm going to take these three things. I don't want this morning to talk particularly about Daniel 3, but I'm going to take these three things from Daniel 3. And so here's what I'm going to do this morning. Instead of taking 60 minutes to talk about Daniel 3, which I would love to do and would probably be good for you, honestly, instead of doing that, I'm going to take 60, I'm going to give you Daniel 3 this morning in 60 seconds. So here goes. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, the most powerful monarch on the planet, set up a golden image, commanded everybody in the vassal nations to come and the leaders to worship it. It was a means of consolidating his control. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, three Hebrew young men who served in the king's court, refused to bow before the image because Yahweh had said to them, I am the Lord your God, and you shall have no other gods before me. And they simply would not compromise their convictions. As a result of that, they were threatened with death. But their response to that was, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. He will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. They were thrown into a furnace of fire. But God demonstrated his love and power and sovereignty and delivered them. Nebuchadnezzar was amazed, at least temporarily, And he praised the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego with four seconds to go. So there you go. That's Daniel 3. Now there's a lot in Daniel 3, a lot that we could talk about and a lot that we have talked about before. But here's the bottom line of that story, ladies and gentlemen. The bottom line of that story is that these, these young men were young. And secondly, they were away from home. And third, they were forced to make a choice. And I will tell you, that's true of every student in this audience today. Whether you're walking out your front door to go to an elementary school, a middle school, a high school, or if you're going to college, those three things are going to be true for you. They're going to be true for you for some of you in elementary school, middle school, and high school for that day. You're going to be away from home that day. For some of you go to college or university, you're going to be away from home in a more permanent basis. But every single day, regardless of your your age and, and grade, you're going to face some choices. You're going to face some choices about the person you're going to be as a young person trying to reflect the image of God. And so again, this morning, what I'd like to do is just give you three things that you can take to school with you that are going to help you tremendously along that line. So let me share them with you very quickly and less than to be yours. Here they are from Daniel chapter three. Number one, conviction. And conviction simply asks the question, what do you believe? What do you believe? These three young men were men of conviction. They were away from home. They were away from the view of their mom and dad. And they were surrounded by people who didn't believe anything like like they believed. And yet, and yet, none of that changed what they believed, what they understood and knew to be right and what they believed to be wrong. Now, we saw that early in the book of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 1, when when Daniel, for example, purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies. And so Daniel had decided in his heart, as a young person away from home, here's what I'm going to do. I will not compromise my values. In the book of Ezra, the prophet has said that Ezra devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord and to teaching his decrees and laws in Israel. And the point of it is that he devoted himself to doing what the will of God was. Conviction. There is an old cliche that says that you've got to stand for something or you'll fall for everything. Conviction is being convinced. 
It is drawing a line that you just will not cross. <coughs> it, is, it is a conviction that, that leads to commitment. And commitment leads you to ask some questions. You know, what, is God, what does God want me to do? What, what does God's Word say about this? How can I please God today in, in this particular matter? Because regardless of who you are and regardless of where you go to school, you're, you're going to find some people who are, who are just the opposite of that. It doesn't matter where you go to school. You're going to go to school with some young people that will go with the flow and they will believe and practice one thing today and another thing tomorrow, just kind of depending on what their friends want them to do. And like a chameleon, they'll, they'll change colors to blend in with their surroundings. And they'll let others determine <coughs> what is right and what is wrong for them. And I want to say to the young people in our audience, the great young people in this church, that you're better than that. I know you're better than that. You know, the psalmist David said, <clears throat> the psalmist David said in Psalm 119, how can a young man keep his way pure? Well, by, by guarding <clears throat> it according, according to your word. In 1 Timothy 4, and beginning in verse 12, Paul wrote to his protege, Timothy, and he said, don't let anybody look down on you because of, because of your youthfulness. But be an example for the believers in speech and conduct and love and truth and in purity. What does that mean? Well, young people, if you're in the audience today and you've been baptized into Christ, what that means for you is that you need to go to school this week and you need to speak and act in such a way that it honors the commitment that you made to God when you were baptized. And if you're a young person in this audience and you haven't been baptized as yet, it means that you need to go to school and live out Luke 2.52 where it was said about Jesus that he increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man, which means that you go to school and you speak and act in such a way that you are increasing in favor with God and in favor with others as you, as you represent God. And you're a young person who's trying to honor God as they should. Well, all that's conviction. Conviction again asks, what do you believe? But the only way you can live at school with conviction is if you have the second element, and that's courage. The only way to have conviction that leads to commitment where you draw a line and say, I'm not going to cross that regardless of the circumstance is if you have some courage. And courage just ask, are you willing to fight for your convictions? Are you willing to fight for your convictions? I mean, what a decision these three young men in Daniel 3 had to make. Because their choice, listen to me carefully, their choice determined whether or not they would live or die. Now they didn't get to think about that for a week or two. They didn't get to call mom and dad and ask for their information and their input about that. They had to make a choice on their own and then live with the consequence of the choice that they make. Let's be really honest this morning. <clears throat> for every young person in this audience you're probably not going to face that kind of life or death choice because of your faith. And we ought to be thankful for that. But I will tell you that you might well be put in a position where you have to make a choice, make a decision that determines whether or not one day you get a job or keep a job, or whether you pass a class or fail a class, or whether you keep a friend or lose a friend. The beauty of the story of Daniel 3 is <clears throat> that their convictions ultimately gave them the courage not to compromise. I mean, they knew what was right, they knew what was true, and they knew there could be no deviation from what was right and true. Now, I've got to tell you, deviation would have been easy. Compromise for Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego would have been the easiest thing in the world. I mean, they could have very easily said, look, my mom and dad aren't here. They're not going to see. They're not going to know. My priest is in here. Nobody's going to know. They could have said, look, <clears throat> this is the law. This is the king's edict, and God wants us to be good citizens of the nations where we find ourselves. Or they could have said, look, everybody else is bowing, and if everybody else is doing this, surely it can't be all wrong. Or i tell you what they could have easily said, look, I'm going to bow. I I'm going to bow, but God knows that in my heart, I'm still standing. I mean, they could have compromised this every way imaginable, but they don't do that. I ask you this morning to open to Matthew chapter 10. Do you have your Bible? I want you to read something with me. Matthew chapter 10. 
In Matthew 10, we have described for us what is commonly called the limited commission, where Jesus sends his disciples out and he sends them on a very limited, focused commission, and he sends them out in pairs two by two. He tells them that they're not going to be well received everywhere, that that's just part and parcel of being a, a disciple of his, that not everybody's going to be welcoming to you. But here's what he says about that, beginning in Matthew 10, in verse number 26. After he tells them, look, not everybody's going to be happy with you. Here's what he says in verse 26. Therefore, he says, do not fear them. There is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be made known. Whatever I tell you in the light or in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetop. And he said, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And what one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But in fact, the very heirs of your head are all numbered. That is, God knows and cares about you. So his conclusion of verse 31 again is, do not fear, therefore. You are of more value <clears throat> than, many, than many sparrows. And so he says, look, I'm sending you on this commission. Not everybody's going to be happy with you. Not everybody will treat you well. Not everybody's going to be pleased with the way you live or what you say. But did you notice, ladies and gentlemen, that he says these things three times. Have no fear of them. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. And he said, do not be afraid. Well, that sounds nice. That's easy on Sunday morning in this building. There's no problem with it here. The challenge of the, of the matter is that, that oftentimes, that oftentimes our natural response to oppression, persecution, disagreement, opposition is in fact fear. It is a natural human response. And yet Jesus said, I want you to, to act in a way that is not, not natural here. I want you to trust me. It's interesting, again, that, that one of the most oft-repeated commands in the Bible is don't fear. We talked about that three Sundays ago, where we, where we said, you know, it's very common to hear that do not fear, fear not. Some aspect of that is repeated 365 times in the Bible, one time for every day of the year. And we just say, that's not true. You know, maybe a hundred times, but not 300 times. But a hundred times is pretty significant. God had to say that to some of his great heroes. He had to say that to Moses, by the way. He had to say that to Joshua on multiple occasions. Don't be afraid of them. I'll be with you. So, so don't, don't fear. You say, what, what's the significance of that this morning? Let's think about that in a way that sometimes we don't. So I want to ask every young person in our audience today, every, every one of you is going to go to school this week. Have you ever done something that you knew was wrong, but you did it anyway? Not because you particularly wanted to do it, but because you were afraid of being the only one in your peer group not doing it. I, I wonder how many times we sin because we're afraid not to because of the setting we find ourselves in. Most young people in this audience, I would imagine, know what it's like to be in a cafeteria or a hallway and be extremely uncomfortable with words that are being said or things that are being done, but say nothing and sometimes join in simply because you're afraid of, of being left out of that. I wonder how many young people in this audience, I'll guarantee you there are a lot who've been involved with your, with your friends group and they're wanting to do something that you know is wrong and you feel that awkwardness of fear of saying no and risking the friendship. But of course, part of becoming a mature, a mature Christian, is to face those kind of challenges and do what Jesus said here. Don't have fear of them. Don't, don't be afraid of them. You know, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, <clears throat> they faced they a faced the, the penalty of death. Now, we know that's not really our fear in America, don't we? And we're, we're thankful for that. I mean, the fact of the matter is, there's not anybody in this audience. There's nobody in this audience who's afraid that when we dismiss today, there are going to be authorities out there waiting to arrest us and say, you all been at a worship service. We're going to arrest you for that. You may well be put to death for being at worship today. We, that thought didn't even enter our mind. And for our young people, in elementary school, middle school, high school, our college students, and nobody's afraid that, that, you're going to, that, that if you speak up, 
If you're in college and you, you speak up to a, to a professor that you're going to be put to death for that. Or that if you say no to your peer group in high school or middle school about some wrong activity, that you're going to be put to death for that. That's just not going to happen. But you might be shunned. And that's a type of death, isn't it? It's a type of death where a relationship can die. A type of death where maybe your friends don't return your calls or answer your texts. Or maybe where you get a reduced grade because you push back on something that was taught in a class. Or maybe as a young athlete, you lose your place on a team because you won't miss worship service or practice or games. Young people, I want you to listen to me really, really carefully here. <clears throat> Could I just say one thing to you about that? School is going to end one day. Now, that may seem like it's infinitely in the future right now, but the fact is, school's going to end one day. There's going to be a day when you will attend the last class and you will take the last test and you will graduate for the last time. And then, young people, in about two minutes, those people are going to be out of your life. In about two minutes, you will never see those people again. Don't let them cost you your soul. Conviction and courage <clears throat> are immensely helped when we have one other thing, and that is when we have a focus on Christ. And it, that asks the question, who, who holds your heart? Now that's in Daniel 3, by the way. We didn't read that part of the story, but in the fire, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, they are there, and it is said that they are communing with the Son of God. Wouldn't you have loved to have heard that conversation? But taking Christ with you in, in your educational endeavors it asks, who, who really holds your heart? That is critically important because conviction and courage without the inclusion of Christ, that may be, that may be the stuff of, of legends and, and movies and stories. But for the Christian, the inclusion of Christ makes all the difference in the world because for us, it is Christ that forgives and intercedes and helps. And so the question is, do you trust Him? Do you trust Him? In Matthew chapter 10 that we read a moment ago, that's really what Jesus is saying when he says, look, I'm telling you three times here, don't, don't fear that. The question is, he's saying, do you trust me about this? Do you believe that in spite of whatever temptations and doubts that may occasionally raise their head, do you believe that he always wants what is best for you? Do you believe that, that doing what he says is always the best things to do? If you're a young person today, in this audience, I, I want to tell you three reasons why, why you ought to trust, why you ought to learn to trust the Lord. Number one, because He's your creator. Because he, God just says, I'm your, I'm your creator. He is the manufacturer and we are the product. And the creator always knows what's best for His creation. And secondly, God says, I love you. I love you. And if you ever wonder about that or doubt about that, just look to the cross. But the significance of that is that it means that whatever God, whatever Jesus would say for you ought to do, or what you ought to not do. It springs from a position of love. It's just like your mom and dad. Your mom and dad have never once ever said to you, here's what I want you to do, or here's what I forbid you to do, without that springing from a heart of love that wants only the best for you. And because of your experience. Because even if you're young, even if you are very young in this audience, <clears throat> you've, you've probably lived long enough long enough to experience and learn that when you do what the Lord says for you to do, it makes things better for you. It makes things better with you, with your parents, and it will make things better ultimately in your life. You never go wrong by doing life God's way. Conviction, courage, and Christ. I'll guarantee you those aren't any of the school supply lists that you've read. But I'll tell you also, for young people who are trying to honor Christ, those three things are essential. <clears throat> let, me, let me end with this this morning. Let me end with this this morning. Young people, I want you to remember that 
that you're part of a family and you're not on your own here. You are not on your own. Now, don't, don't put everything away here and close up shop just yet. I, I want, to, want you to focus with me for just one more minute. Young people, whether you're in elementary school or middle school or high school or college, I want you to know that you are not your own, on your own. We're here for you. We love you. We believe in you. We are pulling for you. We want you to succeed. So young people, I want you to listen to something the Apostle Paul wrote in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Listen to what he wrote these brethren. He said, we do, want, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we've experienced. In other words, Paul says, look, I can relate to your life. You're going to go to school. It's not, all going to be, it's not always going to be easy. There are going to be difficulties. You're not going to get through 12 or 16 years of school without there being challenges. And so he says, I want you to know that we've experienced troubles too. But listen to what else he said. He said, on Christ we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. And then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in the answer to the many prayers that you have offered. And so young people, I just want you to know that your church family is going to pray for you. We love you, care about you, and we will pray for you. And you need to do that for yourself, and you need to do that for others as well. But in particular, we want to do that for you. We, we want you to know that we're on your side. In your family report this morning, <clears throat> I put a note. I put a note about a, that was given to me from a preaching friend in the state of Texas where one of the ladies in his church family at the beginning of the school year had sent this little, this little note to every young person that was going to school in their church family. It's on the front page of your family report, and here's what, here's what she wrote to every young person in their church. She said, I'm writing to all of our young people who will be starting school. I'm writing to remind you that you are not alone. For one thing, nearly every adult you know is pulling for you to succeed in almost everything you do this year, academically, artistically, athletically, dramatically, musically. We want to see what you'll accomplish this year. We want to see you flourish. We want to see you smile and hear your laughter. We want to share in the joy that comes your way every day. We want you to know this. And in this church family, we, we want all of our young people to know that we're on your side because we're a family. Now look, <clears throat> maybe you're here this morning. Maybe you're here this morning you're thinking, you know what, Don? This whole back to school thing, <laughs> it doesn't affect me. Uh, that is long ago in my life. I'm going to get up tomorrow morning, not go to school. I'm going to work. I'm going to the real world tomorrow. That's good. But let me tell you something. When you go to work tomorrow, there are three things you need to take with you. Conviction, and courage, and Christ. And if you go to work without those three things this week, you'll fail spiritually. So this has everything to do with you. But it's also a reminder that when you go to, <clears throat> go to work tomorrow, and when you go to work especially on Thursday and you begin to see those school buses that are rolling places, let that be a reminder of our young people in this church family who are going to school that day. And let it be a reminder of our young people who in a week or two are going to be going to college. And let it be a reminder to pray for them. So here's what I want us to do before we stop. <clears throat> I want to ask every young person in this audience, if you are in elementary school, middle school, high school, or college, I want you to ask you please to stand up right where you are. Okay, just go ahead and stand up. Mom and dads, help your kids. Here we go. Look at that, man. Look at these amazing young people. These are tremendous young people. I want you all to know how proud we are of you. You all make us proud <clears throat> every single week. We're so proud of who you are and the image of God that you try to reflect. And we're praying that you will have an amazing school year. And we want to pray over you and for you right now. So let's bow our heads. 
Our good Father, we're thankful for these amazing young people that you have brought to our church family, these young people that we love so very, very much. We pray, we pray that in this school year that they will be surrounded with the whole armor of God. We pray that you will keep them safe physically, and we pray that you will keep them safe spiritually, and we pray that you will keep them safe relationally. We pray, Father, they will pursue excellence with a passion. And we pray, Holy God, that they will always give more than ask and better than expected in all that they do. And we pray that when they begin school this week that they will do so with conviction about what is right, courage to defend their convictions, and always with the Son of God, Christ Jesus, in their heart. And may they know that they are never alone, for you are with them and we care for them. We pray this in Jesus' name, and amen. Thank you, young people. You can be seated. I wonder this morning as we close, I wonder if there are any young people here today who feel the tug of the gospel and who say, you know what, I want to be a Christian. I want to be a student that is a role model for what it means to have a relationship with Christ. You can begin that process today. I wonder if there are any teachers, administrators in this room today who need to say, you know what, this year is going to be a bit different because I'm going to be different. I'm going to be spiritually richer and better and deeper and try to reflect that more than I ever have in the past. I wonder if there are those in this audience today who aren't student or teachers, but you know that today is the day for you to commit your life to Christ. Maybe you've been waiting, but you understand that today is the day to make that commitment in the water of baptism. If that's you today, and we can help you. We hope you'll let us. Let's stand and let's sing. Jesus is in the seconds or less, but we will put no timer up for this, I promise you. So happy that you're with us today, delighted to have you worshiping with us, and again, if you're visiting, so thankful that you've come our way. Appreciate all who've helped us worship this morning, Bart's good song direction along with Tyler. Tyler's going to be moving to Ellisville, Missouri. Ellisville is a suburb of St. Louis, wonderful, wonderful church there, and we pray that all will go very well for him. I think today is going to be his last Sunday with us, and we pray that everything will go. Tyler, is today your last Sunday with us? I thought that was right. We hope everything goes wonderfully well for you with that wonderful church family. On your announcement slides this morning are a variety of notes that have to do with Don Copes and Marie Adams and Frank Racine, but also, <clears throat> let's mention what is not there. Flora Wheeler has asked that we pray for her sister who is in the ICU in, Birmingham, in a hospital in Birmingham, Alabama, and we've been asked to pray for her. I want to read you a card that uh, we received from Megan Barrett. And um, Megan, of course, is leaving us to go study elsewhere in this country. We've, uh, we've loved having Megan and still have her brother worshiping with us. But would you listen, listen to what she wrote this church family? She said to my Temple Terrace church family, in leaving the Tampa area after four years, I've thought a lot about how God has blessed this time and the people he has brought into my life. Coming from a small church in California, I initially thought Temple Terrace was far too different to be a church family I could call home during my years at Florida College. I had no idea the people and rich blessings I would find here. This church is full of people working to actively demonstrate Christ's love and their devotion to his teachings. I have seen firsthand God's wisdom and how a church family provides for its members' needs. When I was sick for a semester, I was amazed at how eager this family is to serve one another. Thank you all for helping to challenge and grow my faith 
modeling service and Christian character and for always being there when, we, when I've needed a helping hand. I will miss you all and continually pray for God's blessing on our, your lives and in your work for his kingdom. In Christian love and gratitude, Megan Barrett. She is a beautiful young lady with a beautiful soul, and she's been a blessing to us. And thank you for being the kind of church family that's been a blessing to her life. I want to remind you that at 5 o'clock today, we have classes for everyone. And, of course, our new adult Bible classes got off to a great start last Sunday and Wednesday night. <clears throat> Those will continue. We have adult classes. Worship in song is being taught in the auditorium. What's so amazing about grace that I'm teaching in room 107. The Christian Journey, a guide to prayer, worship, and Bible study in room 103 with John Watt. And a study of Kings and Chronicles with Sean McConaughey in room 108. Four really good opportunities to study and to learn. We look forward to having you with us at five. Thanks for being with us this morning.